Long ago in Palestine, two disciples of Jesus were walking along the road from Jerusalem to Emmaus. This is the first day of the week after the crucifixion of Jesus. They are forlorn. No doubt their shoulders drooped. Their heads were downcast. Everything about them eloquently testified to the sadness that was in their hearts. A stranger joins them, and the stranger, as they converse, says some very strange things that are intended to, com uh, to comfort them. <coughs> how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. You see, they did not understand some things about the Old Testament, and so this stranger helps them with that. In Luke 24 and verse 27, it says, Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. This was something that absolutely filled them with a fire, as they later acknowledged when they reported back to the other brethren that the Lord had risen indeed. The simple reality is that the entire Bible is focused on Jesus as its grand and overarching theme. The whole Old Testament finds its focus in Jesus, his life, his death, and his resurrection. Jesus had promised at the very outset of his gospel ministry, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. When I was young, I thought about that incident on the Emmaus Road and thought, Oh, how wonderful it would be to be able to hear that expository sermon. And I naively thought that maybe I had missed out on something very valuable. But that is not the case at all. The simple reality is that we have in the New Testament all the information I am confident that the Lord would have imparted to those two and then later to all the disciples on that first day. After his, uh, that first day of the week after his resurrection. As we read the Gospels, the sermons and Acts, the epistles, especially Romans and Galatians, and preeminently as we read the book of Hebrews, we have explained for us from the law and the prophets all those things that Jesus would have enlightened their minds about. Now, the importance of studying the Old Testament prophecies and types I think is known to every one of us who are present. So I won't argue the case, but I need to explain a little bit about the types and their interpretation. If we go back to Genesis chapter 3, we find there the first verbal prophecy, sometimes called the Proto-Evangelium, and the first type. And we'll explain what that is in just a moment for those who may not know. What we find in verse 15 is that prophecy, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Well, I just now got it started, Shahi. I'm sorry. I thought I'd started it. In Genesis 3 and 21, shortly after that prophecy is given to Satan, we find this statement, else also for Adam and his wife, the Lord made tunics of skin and clothed them. That is taken by the vast majority of Bible scholars as the first uh, typical foreshadowing of the coming substitutionary sacrifice that would be made by God, by Jesus, in the due time as we have already studied tonight from Isaiah 53. In fact, our, our subject tonight from Leviticus 16, along with Isaiah 53, are the two great chapters, though there are many in the Old Testament, that bring out the great substitutionary atoning sacrifice of Jesus in prophecy and in uh, the types, the foreshadowings of the Old Testament. Clinton Lockhart is a good source for understanding the nature of types. He writes... A type is an object that antedates another object which it is designed to prefigure and with which it involves a like moral or religious principle. A type is not necessarily a prophecy because its uh, typical significance may not be made known in the age in which the object itself appears, while a prophecy must be a revelation in advance of the event predicted. 
He makes a couple of points. I won't read the passages from uh, his work, uh, Principles of Interpretation, but uh, the idea is that a type does not necessarily have to have a multiplicity of coincidences with that which it foreshadows. For example, I think to illustrate is the best way to communicate this point, Moses is a type of Jesus. Not in his sin of striking the rock, uh, not in other ways which show his humanity, but uh, as a lawgiver. Solomon is a type of Christ, as the one who built the temple, as the one who re reigned in regal splendor over his uh, kingdom. But there were many defects in Solomon's character and in his behavior before God. David himself would be a type, but that would not, of course, include the many mistakes that David made in his life. Now, one important thing about types is that we're not free to just willy-nilly decide what is and what is not a type from the Old Testament. In fact, the, the point needs to be made very clearly that the Word of God is our aid in determining what is a foreshadowing of a New Testament spiritual reality. For example, in Romans 5 and verse 14, Adam is very definitely declared to be a figure of him who was to come. Let's see if it still works. Yes, it does. That's the important thing. And elsewhere we have uh, likenesses that are pointed out for our spiritual edification. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 6, referring to the experiences of the Israelites passing through the sea in the wilderness, the Apostle Paul says, now these things were our examples or types, is the word evidently in the Greek. Accordingly, the Apostle Paul could not have been more plain in verse 11 of that chapter when he says, Now these things happened unto them typically, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages are come. Apparently that is Lockhart's translation. So our focus in this study is going to be upon a central piece of the Old Testament system of worship and sacrifice called the Day of Atonement. In this day, the sacrificial law of Moses attains its supreme expression. The holiness and the grace alike of Israel's God, its fullest revelation. For the like of the great day of atonement, we look in vain in any other people or nation. If every sacrifice pointed to Christ, then this does most luminously of all. What Isaiah 53 is to his messianic prophecies, that we may truly say is Leviticus 16 to the whole system of Mosaic types. Adam Clark's commentary presents something very important to our minds concerning uh, the massive amount of blood that was shed in the uh, typical sacrifices that were offered in the temple and before that in the tabernacle. Why is this important to show? Because uh, this is a central idea to the whole idea of atonement. Blood must be shed. Remember Genesis 3 and verse 21. An innocent victim, some innocent animal, died and gave its skin to be a covering for the nakedness of Adam and Eve. And the likeness there is that an innocent victim who would substitute in uh, uh, offering to man, who would be the, the one who would offer the means of covering man's sin. An innocent victim had to die to make that possible. But uh, Adam Clark tells us that uh, uh, on this particular season of the, of the Jewish year, there were a number of sacrifices that were offered, and on this particular occasion, and during this season, at the public charge, there were annually offered to God, independently of trespass offerings and voluntary vows, 15 goats, 21 kids, 72 rams, and 132 bullocks, and 1,101 lambs. Add to this the number of paschal lambs that could be slain during the Passover season. And it could be very clearly seen that the sacrifices of Israel it involved a lot of blood. Now, some of you may not have grown up on farms. I did. And I've seen animals that were slaughtered for food. And one thing I think about as I think about the sacrifices of Israel is how much blood was involved in those sacrifices. And the spectacle, as the worshiper came and he placed his hands and thereby offered this, this animal as the substitute 
which was a very imperfect substitute and did not do away with his sins, as we shall see. And then watch that animal slain. He sees there a powerful picture of the awfulness of his sin, the just deserts of his sin, which is death, but the mercy of God in allowing a substitute to take his place. But now all of these sacrifices, all of this that went on year in, year out, all that shedding of blood really, really was a temporary measure. In fact, the scriptures tell us in Hebrews 10 and verse 4, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. And so today, as we look at the Day of Atonement, we need to understand that uh, this is what we're headed for. Now, quickly, let us look at the plan of the tabernacle. This, of course, is the holy place. This is the most holy place of the holiest of holies. And in here, the Ark of the Covenant stands. It's a box, a rectangle, uh, not very big, but in this cube, and that is literally a cube according to the directions that Moses gave in Exodus, the, the high priest was to enter but once a year going to this second veil. The first veil would be the curtain that separated the holy place from the outside court. The second veil goes from the uh, holy place into the most holy place. And we shall see as we proceed uh, what these things were intended to represent. The Apostle Paul in Hebrews 9, verse 1 through 5, is talking about the plan of this tabernacle. And he says, Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part, in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things, we cannot now speak in detail. And that's pretty much how I'm going to have to leave it. We cannot talk about these things in detail right now. But this is where the high priest, once in the year on the Day of Atonement, would come uh, first with the blood of his own sacrifice to atone for his sins, and then with blood on behalf of the nation to atone uh, for the nation's sins. So, let's get a little bit of uh, understanding about the out uh, layout of the book of Leviticus. Uh, the book has a structure where... The first seven chapters are talking about the various sacrifices that are to be offered at the tabernacle slash temple. One thing that we learn from these offerings is that atonement is costly. Forgiveness is costly. It's not cheap. It comes at a dear price. And it's won by the blood. Then we have laws of the priest. And of course in chapter 10 we have the death of Nadab and Abihu because of their uh, violating God's will and plan for their uh, work in the temple. What exactly that might have been is certainly uh, debatable, but uh, it seems that they offered, according to that passage of Scripture, strange fire, that which was foreign to what God had given or intended for them to do. It's interesting that following the death of Nadab and Abihu, we have those laws of purity that are to define so clearly for Israel that God is the one who decides what is, what is unclean and clean, uh, what is pure and impure. God is the one who sets the rules. There is an absolute standard for truth, and it is clearly seen in his word. And then in chapter 16, which is really the center and the hub of the entire book of Leviticus, we have the Day of Atonement. Now, in these laws of purity, an interesting fact that we see there is uh, a lot of rules that were to make sure the nation was clean physically as well as uh, spiritually. In fact, many of these laws in this part of the book actually manifest a scientific foreknowledge or a uh, knowledge of science far ahead of uh, this temporal world. Our scientists didn't know until the 1800s about microbes or germs, but it's clear from many of these laws and regulations that the giver of the law of Moses, the giver of Leviticus, knew about them. And in fact, during the times when Europe was racked with the Black Death, during those times of plague, 
the Jewish communities in Europe were spared and hardly touched at all, which just made some of the errorists on the outside of their communities hate them all the more and actually blame them for the Black Death. But then we have laws of holiness, and these laws are to govern uh, the moral, moral and, and uh, the moral and ethical relations of the nation and so forth. But let's talk about the definition for atonement. The general Greek, uh, the, the general Hebrew word is kapar or kipper, uh, depending on which scholar you're reading, they spell it different ways. And generally translated, it means to atone, to wipe clean, to appease. Now they debate the root meaning of the word, but I think that the term wipe clean or wipe away um, is clearly the main idea. For example, in Genesis 32 and verse 20, And you shall say, Behold, your servant Jacob also is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with this present that goes before me. Then afterward I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. This is talking about Jacob trying to appease his brother Esau by wiping the anger off of his face with many gifts. Proverbs 16, verse 14, the fury of a king is like messengers of death, but a wise man will appease it. Kapar. In Israel's religious ceremonies, other than the Day of Atonement, Kapar usually refers to God's wiping away sin through various sacrifices. Just one example, Leviticus 1, verse 4, he shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering that it may be accepted for him to make atonement on his behalf. In Greek, we have the word halaskomai. Now, there's, there's other related uh, and synonymous terms, and we're just going to touch upon these ones for the most part to get the, the main idea of what we're talking about in atonement. This Greek word means to atone, have mercy on, to make atonement for, propitiate. Uh, the words expiate and propitiate are maybe used more often in modern translations uh, to render some of these terms in the New Testament. But the idea here, and this actual word, although there are cognate words that are used other times, this actual word is only used two times in the New Testament. For example, it is used in Luke 18 and verse 13, where the tax collector asks God to have mercy on him, and, uh, who is a sinner. He wants his sins forgiven by God's grace. And so the idea is of wiping away of forgiveness. In Hebrews 2 and verse 17, Jesus is identified with the high priest of the Old Testament who uses blood from various sacrifices in order to turn God's anger away from his people that their sins might be atoned for, wiped out, and thus forgiven. The Greek word, uh, excuse me, the English word atonement, um, according to the Oxford Dictionary of Word Histories, uh, means to make or become united or reconciled. And so, etymologically speaking, the word atonement isn't really uh, an exact translation, although we understand it to have mercy, to forgive, and so forth. Um, the, the English word literally and originally meant to, to bring parties who were alienated together to bring harmony in their relationship. And uh, the idea of being at one, and the suffix mint, uh, uh, teaching basically a state of being at one. And uh, you can see there that the word is not of a very ancient derivation, but it is in fact, that's the meaning of the word in the English language. Well, let's turn our attention now to the actual Day of Atonement. And our focus is going to be on Leviticus 16, though it is addressed in other passages. These other passages emphasize the role of the people in response to the uh, ordinance of the Day of Atonement. And we'll talk about that later in the lesson. It's called by various names. It's called the Day of Atonement, in, or in the Talmud, it is simply called the Day. And uh, it's called the Fast in Acts 27 and verse 9. It took place on the tenth uh, day of the seventh month, and uh, the Hebrews of this day, as they did then, call it Yom Kippur. And it is a, a date in the calendar of the modern state of Israel that is one of their most important holidays. And so according to uh, both ancient and modern calendars, this is a, a day in which the Jewish people, though they cannot do it any longer, according to the directions give it, given in Leviticus 16, uh, they observe this as a day of seeking God's forgiveness. Now, I want to point out, the book of Hebrews in the New Testament is the key 
to really understanding Leviticus. It is the book that explains so much about the Levitical system. The book of Hebrews was written to Christians who were in danger of going back from following Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, to a system that involved multiple and daily sacrifices that could not take away sin. They were much set upon by their brethren. They were persecuted. They were made to suffer. And so there was, a, there was an attraction to just taking the pressure off and defecting, going back. And that's what the Hebrew epistle is all about, teaching and arguing to teach them and to uh, instill in them the idea that to do so is to go back to an inferior covenant and an inferior me, uh, remediation of sin that did not satisfy God's demand for forgiving sin. So, let's talk about the unique service of the day very quickly, and then I will make a threefold application of what we can learn uh, using the book of Hebrews as our guide. First of all, on this day, it says in Leviticus 16, verse 1 through 2, Now after the Lord spoke to Moses, after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they had approached the presence of the Lord and died, the Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron that he shall not enter at any time into the holy place inside the veil, before the mercy seat which is on the ark, or he will die, for he, for I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. When he says not at any time, he doesn't mean never, but he means not at just any time you care to step in. But there was an appointed time, and that was on the Day of Atonement, the tenth day of the seventh month. And so, special preparations were required for this ritual on the Day of Atonement, according to verses 3-5. through five. five animals were to be used in the worship. Aaron shall enter the holy place with this, with a bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen tunic, and the linen undergarment shall be next to his body, and he shall be girded with the linen sash and attired with a linen turban. These are holy garments." Then he shall bathe his body in water and put them on. He shall take from the congregation of the sons of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. In preparation, Aaron is required to bathe himself and then put on the clothing that was to be worn. Bathing is a vivid symbol of the necessity of cleansing before entering God's presence. Even the high priest needed this cleansing. The writer of the book of Hebrews emphasizes the dramatic difference that we can see here between Christ's priestly work and Aaron's. The writer says in Hebrews 7, verse 26 through 27, For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who did not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once for all when he offered up himself. So we have a difference between the type and the antitype, which it was foreshadowing. The priest, the high priest, on this day, first has to make satisfaction. He has to offer a sacrifice for himself before he is fit to represent the nation. No such need was found in Christ, our high priest. The clothing that Aaron was to wear on this special day was different from the normal high priestly attire described in Exodus 28. The clothing this day is the clothing of a servant. Now the regular high priestly attire was, uh, had a lot of gold about it, a lot of jewels, a lot of uh, splendor, so that he looked like a, a regal character in his normal high priestly attire. But when he comes into the presence of God in the holiest of holies, he is dressed in garb that would even be inferior to that of the regular priest. He's, he's dressed as a servant or as a Levite who attends in the court might be dressed. And so there's eight steps or eight, you might say, acts in this drama. First, Aaron, I'm not going to read the passages of Scripture that line up with this, although uh, you will certainly be able to take this PowerPoint and maybe do further study as you're able. Aaron had to make a sin offering as an atonement for his own, own sins and for those of his household. And he was to do this uh, with incense as he entered into the presence of God. The only place in the Bible where we have any clue what this incense were to represent, and I've, I've read some things that were rather fantastic, like uh, one writer says, uh, the incense was to becloud that inner chamber so that he couldn't see God and wouldn't die. Well, 
I think a better explanation can be found as we search the scriptures in Revelation 5 and verse 8. What does that incense in any way represent? It says in that passage I just named, Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And so when this high priest Aaron uh, and his successors entered in to the presence of God, he carries uh, incense into God's presence, representing the fact that the priest, the high priest, our high priest bears our prayers into God's presence. Step number two, Aaron cast lots to determine which of the two goats is to be sacrificed as a sin offering for the Lord, which is to become the scapegoat. According to Edersheim's description of the rite, there was a bowl-like affair in which were two lots made of uh, some durable substance, might have been wood or metal or stone, and on one was inscribed the name of the Lord, and on the other was inscribed as Azel. And he would reach in, and he would grab these two uh, articles, and one on each hand, and he would hold them out, and there would be one goat there, and one goat on his right, and one goat on his left, and he would open up his hand, and if this one said as Azel, then that goat on the right would be the scapegoat. If it said for the Lord, then that one would be the victim that died, and it would be the one whose blood was shed. And then, thirdly, the first goat would be sacrificed as a sin offering for the people. Now, in the opening verses, it said that he was to take uh, uh, a bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. What's the difference between the two? And uh, you can study the first chapters of Leviticus, and that will give you some insight. But basically, for the purposes of our understanding here, the burnt offering was the typical standard offering going clear back to the time of Abel that was intended as an atonement for sin. It was a whole burnt offering. The beast was taken, it was slain, its blood was shed, and it was burned whole upon the altar, whether it was Abel's or Noah's or Abraham's or in the tabernacle courtyard. The sin offering involved the slaying of the animal, the taking of certain pieces, as defined by the law of Moses, and the burning of those pieces, usually called the fat, and then the rest of it was taken and uh, disposed of outside the camp. And there's a significance to that that we'll be noticing shortly. The fourth and a very interesting and significant event on this day was the taking of one of the goats, the scapegoat, the one on whom the lot had fallen for Azazel, and it would be sent into the wilderness. It would be led by a man who would take it and bring it into the wilderness. It says there in verses 21 and 22 of Leviticus 16, Then Aaron shall lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the sons of Israel and all their transgressions in regard to all their sins. And he shall lay them on the head of the goat and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who stands in readiness. The goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to a solitary land, and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. The next act in this day, uh, day's drama is that Aaron would go into the holy place and remove the special garments that he had donned on this occasion. He would bathe once more and put on his regular vestments. Now, according to Edersheim, there were actually going to be five changes of clothing and five bathings on this day. And... Uh, because they also had to offer the daily sacrifices, and according to uh, Numbers uh, 23, they had to offer certain other special sacrifices, which are not the subject of our study right now. There was a total of 15 animals offered that day, and uh, that was the 15 who was slain. There was one, this goat, uh, for Az Azel, that was released. Now, there's been a lot of debate and discussion among the commentators as to exactly what this goat for Az Azel means. And uh, again, Clinton Lockhart, in his uh, passage in page 121 through 123, treats this word. It's a rare word. It has given a lot of expositors perplexity over the years. And uh, I think the real understanding that helps us to see what it is, it's not, a goat devoted, it's not a goat devoted as a sacrifice to a demon. You'll read that in some commentators. Uh, that is a modernist uh, evolutionary of religion view 
about the whole religious system, worship system of Israel. You can just reject that out of hand. Uh, over there in the next chapter, chapter 17, verse 7, uh, God specifically forbids the children of Israel from worshiping or sacrificing for demons. So that's off the board. That's no account whatsoever. But Az is actually an Aramaic word for goat. Azel means to send away. So it's the goat of sending away. And the idea, I believe, is one that is found in, for example, David's writing in Psalm 103 and verse 12. Very likely David was reflecting upon the scapegoat ritual when he wrote this stanza. Remember the goat is taken out in the wilderness bearing all the sins of the nation. And here's what David says about God's forgiveness. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Oh, what a, what a blessed, blessed revelation that is. Isaiah could well have also had the scapegoat ceremony in mind when he says in Isaiah 53, verse 4 and 6, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, it's curious that in the rest of the Old Testament, and uh, for that matter, the writers of the New Testament don't take much notice of the scapegoat ritual on the Day of Atonement, but I do believe that everything we know about the cross of Christ, his vicarious suffering and death for us as our substitute, our lamb who takes away our sin, John 1 verse 29, uh, points to the fact that this, this goat represents that sending away of sin by the sacrifice of Jesus. Now, another point is that this passage, Leviticus 16, talks about these two goats as one sacrifice and uh, with, with two uh, facets, you might say. First of all, there's the death. There's the atonement provided by the death. And then we have the result typified by the sinning away of the goat bearing sin. The atonement that will be offered by the innocent victim that God would provide would make it possible for sin to be forgiven, to be cast behind his back, to be separated from the sinner as far as the east is from the west. Next, number six, Aaron is to go. Next is to sacrifice the burnt offerings for himself and for his people. And I'm going to have to hurry along here. So uh, the next two steps, the man who's been chosen to escort the scapegoat out into the wilderness must wash his clothing and bathe ceremonially before returning to the camp. And then in the eighth and final act of the day's drama, the remains of the bull and goat used for the sin offering are to be disposed of outside the camp as prescribed for the regular sacrifices. And so we have there the order of service, if you please. Let's try to understand the significance of all this for ourselves. And this is something that uh, is precious when we think about all of this. Remember, the writer of Hebrews is trying to get Jewish brethren to realize the awful, awful mistake they would make if they defected from the new covenant, from Christ, from the high priest <coughs> after the order of Melchizedek, the, uh, the perfect high priest, and went back to a system that was a mere shadow of the wonderful spiritual blessings that are part of the new covenant. Aaron was a sinner in need of atonement, but Jesus was pure and sinless and in need of no atonement. Aaron had often to repeat his sacrifices, daily even, as we've already seen in that passage from Hebrews chapter 10. But eternal redemption was secured by one sacrifice. We don't offer sacrifices often, although some people think that they need to, in masses, for instance. But the reality is, by virtue of that one sacrifice, when you and I understand that we have sinned, we can repent of that sin, we can afflict our souls, we can turn to God in prayer, and we as priests of God can offer the plea, the, the prayer of, for forgiveness, and our high priest will bear that to the throne of God, and that will be granted as he removes our sin based on our repentance as far from us as the east is from the west. In other ways, we can see, and this chart, this, this will be made available to Bart so that this could be a part of your further study on this important subject. But uh, we're going to look at the perfect priest, the plenary uh, pardon, and the, uh, the people as well. The perfect priest, as we've seen, Aaron was only spotless in his dress. 
We know about his sin in the matter of the golden calf in Exodus 32. But Jesus was spotless in every way. As the scriptures tell us over there in the, uh, excuse me, Hebrews, the, the fourth chapter and verse 15, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And the, Hebrews 7, verse 26, we have such a high priest who is fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and become higher than the heavens. He has entered into the real holiest of holies, and not just the pattern that was in the tabernacle. Aaron entered the earthly tabernacle, Jesus entered the heavenly tabernacle. Hebrews 9, verse 11 through 12, but Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of, bull, of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Aaron entered behind the second veil once in the year. Jesus tore asunder the veil of separation. As we can read in the crucifixion accounts, that when he expired after, after calling out, it is finished, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That could only be done by God. As he rent this veil, and for the first time in human history, access into the presence of God was spiritually and really uh, a reality. Aaron offered sacrifices for his own sins, but Jesus offered himself to pay the price of sin for all. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Aaron sacrificed for a nation. Jesus sacrificed for the world. Matthew 20.28 20, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Aaron offered the blood of animals. Jesus offered his own blood 1 Peter 1, verse 18 through 19. As Nate has already so well testified from God's word, the, the idea that God would uh, come to this world, live as a man, give his life for his creation, one of the most profound and uh, astonishing things. So many rebel at it. The Greeks consider it foolishness. Many in our world consider it foolishness. The human sec uh, humanist, secularist, the, the Muslim world, looks at it as absolute lunacy to think that God would allow himself to be so treated and that that's his love for you and I, that he was willing to come and to endure that so we could be reconciled to him. And so Christ is now the mediator of this new and better covenant. Why go back to this old system is the argument of the writer of Hebrews. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Then there was the plenary pardon. Two, gate, two goats were involved in the Day of Atonement. One was sacrificed and its blood was carried into the Holy of Holies. Seven times the priest, the high priest, would dip his finger in that blood and would sprinkle it onto the mercy seat. Seven times over, then he would go out and he would do likewise in the holy place and then out at the altar, thus cleansing the entire sanctuary and its precincts for the ongoing use of the nation in its devotion and worship of God. And then the second beast was sent into the wilderness to bear the iniquities of the children of Israel into oblivion, signifying that when this full and free pardon, this, this fulsome pardon that was given uh, to humanity through Jesus Christ was a reality that sins would be once and for all uh, obliterated, be cast into oblivion as far as the east is from the west. Together, they were one offering for sin. And then, of course, we realize that Jesus was the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Why was it that he was also portrayed here or pictured as a goat? Well, I think this gets in part back to the idea that Nate touched upon in his talk. Uh, as far as the Hebrew people were concerned, the ones who cried out for him to be crucified, the ones who uh, desired for him to be uh, offered up, they looked at him as refuse. They looked at him as something to be objected to or rejected. And so the, the picture of a goat 
Uh, well, it was a clean animal and was involved or could be involved in several of the different sacrifices. On this occasion, I think it symbolizes the, uh, the casting away of the one who was going to be the Redeemer, who was going to be the sin offering for the world, just as Nate has already so well described from Isaiah chapter 53. And so each goat represents a type or a shadow of the work of Christ, and that is uh, the willingness to die and shed his blood and the bearing away of human sin. He does that now as our high priest. When our prayers ascend to the Father through him, he represents us to God, and of course he represents God to us in his prophetic ministry. That's the work of a priest, to stand between God and man and act in the interest of both. And so in Christ we see both goats. Revelation 5 and verse 6, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And so uh, the lamb here is uh, certainly a picture of Jesus' innocence. Uh, the goat could be very well a picture of the revulsion that the nation felt toward him, as Nate has already described. It was necessary for Jesus to come, and there are several different pictures, and, and we have to take all these pictures together to get the full portraiture of the scheme of redemption that God is giving us here. But the main idea is that in this, this picture that we have in the Day of Atonement, we see the forgiveness of God and the forgetting of sin that God has promised because of Christ's sacrifice. And then I want to close with some, I think, very important thoughts about the penitent people. At the end of Leviticus chapter 16, we see that this day was not just a day for the high priest or anyone concerned with the tabernacle. It was for all the people to be involved in. And they were involved in it by, it was, it was the only day during the year when the people are commanded to fast. But that fasting is to be emblematic of afflicting their souls. In other words, they are to reflect on their lives and think about their sins and shortcomings. And they are to feel keenly how much they have disappointed their God. It is a day of personal reflection and repentance. And uh, no work was to be done on this day. Nothing was to distract them or to come before their involvement in this day which did not involve going to the tabernacle or making sacrifices except to attend perhaps in the outer precincts as the priest, the high priest, did his work and attend in prayer. But uh, each person had to be thoughtful about their individual relationship with God and whether or not they were in uh, God's will or striving as they ought to be within God's will. And so uh, the idea is, I think we look at two passages of Scripture. One is Isaiah 51, where we find David is pouring out his heart after he has committed the, the sin of adultery with Bathsheba. Nathan has come to him. Nathan has uh, rebuked him and warned him of the terrible consequences that are going to befall him. This prayer, its superscription indicates it was written by David on the occasion when he confessed his sin over his uh, adultery with Bathsheba. He says, For you do not desire sacrifice. Now that doesn't mean that the sacrifices of the law of Moses were to be ignored, but he's pointing out what the real desire of the Lord is, or else I would give it you. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God, and this is absolutely true in terms of you and I living under the new covenant, are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. And so those worshipers on the Day of Atonement, it wasn't just all about what the high priest was doing. Their responsibility was to think about their lives, to think about the sacrifice that was being made to atone for their sins and to use that as an opportunity to realize the costliness of what human sin involved, both uh, to God and the giving ultimately of His Son, as we can see it from our New Covenant perspective, but also... Uh, to the nation itself and the many gifts and sacrifices that had to be made and to themselves in the cutting off of sin from their lives by repentance. 
That involves sacrifice. And sacrifice isn't sacrifice unless it costs something. And then another passage, one of my favorite in the Old Testament, there at the end of Isaiah, chapter 66, verse 1 and 2. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? For all these things my hand has made and all these things exist, says the Lord. In other words, look at the universe, everything in it. You've built this house for me and you are not worshiping me faithfully in it. Read Isaiah chapter 1. See how, how upset God is with him. He says, I, I, your, your, your sacrifices, your new moons, and all these, these, these things that you're doing, they, they disgust me. And the reason is because they were polluted people who lived polluted lives. He says, this is the one on whom I will look. And the idea of looking on someone is to look on them to save and to help. On him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. That was what was to be going on in the hearts of of the people of Israel on Yom Kippur. Well, my time is up. So I'll close. If there's any questions, anything of that nature, uh, explain a point more fully, I'd be glad to.